Hi, and welcome to our video on biotechnology applications. This video probably isn't going to make a lot of sense if you haven't already watched our biotechnology tools video. So if you need to go back and watch that one before you watch this one, that's totally understandable. In fact, it's recommended. I figured I'd start this one out with a pig with wings because we can't actually make a pig with wings, but I still think it's cool. And it gets at the question of what can we do with biotechnology? What is biotechnology used for? In this video, we're gonna look at a couple of different examples. We're gonna look at examples in genetic engineering. We're gonna look at examples in genetic testing. We're gonna look at examples in cloning. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about the ethical issues in biotechnology. Genetic engineering refers to any time we can directly go in and manipulate the genome of an organism. It's probably easiest to do, and it was first accomplished in bacterial cells. So that's the example that we're going to look at for the purpose of this discussion. In order to carry out genetic engineering, you need a vector, which is some sort of genetic molecule that can hold and then deliver a DNA sequence of interest, something you want to isolate, something you want to use. A good example of a vector are bacterial plasmids. Plasmids are small extra chromosomal sequences of DNA that exist naturally in many bacterial cells. Because they're small and they're made out of DNA, they were one of the first vectors to be developed for use in genetic engineering. Engineered plasmids have several things on them that make them useful for the purpose of genetic engineering. They have reporter genes. These are genes that help us determine whether or not a bacterial cell has taken in our engineered plasmid. These could be things like antibiotic resistance or color reporters that give the bacterial cells in their colonies a particular color. It also has a multiple cloning site. This is an engineered sequence of DNA that has many different restriction sites recognized by different restriction enzymes all together. This is going to be used to cut open the plasmid for the purpose of introducing the DNA molecule of interest that we want and then ligating them together to make our recombinant plasmid. Assuming we've found our target sequence and we have our engineered plasmid, the first thing that we're going to need to do is isolate our target sequence and then integrate it into the plasmid. This is accomplished through restriction enzymes. And the trick here is to use the same restriction enzymes for both the isolation of the DNA molecule and its integration into the plasmid where we want to put it. By using the same restriction enzyme for both purposes, we'll have complementary sticky ends so that when we want to recombine them, we can simply put them together into the same tube and the overhanging bases of the sticky ends will naturally line up due to the base pairing rules. Of course, there are a lot of reasons why it's a little bit more complicated than simply taking these two things, gluing them together, and we're good to go. A common problem that arises is when you want to get a prokaryote to make a eukaryotic gene. Prokaryotic ribosomes can absolutely make eukaryotic proteins if you give them the correct gene. The problem is that eukaryotic genes frequently have introns interspersed throughout the DNA of their genes. In order to get around this, generally what you'll do is make a complementary DNA copy of the gene. Rather than isolating the DNA from the nucleus, you'll isolate the mRNA from the cytoplasm after the introns have been removed, and then use reverse transcriptase to turn that mRNA into a DNA copy of itself. You'll then take that DNA copy and put that into the plasmid. Since the intron sequences are not in the mRNA, they won't be in the DNA copy that you make from it. And prokaryotic systems will then be able to interpret and produce the protein from that eukaryotic gene. Regardless of how you do it, once you have your sequence of interest, you need to put it together with your plasmid, and then use DNA ligase to form the phosphodiester bonds between the two strands. After ligation, you'll have a recombinant DNA molecule. It's a molecule that is composed of DNA from two different places, the plasmid and your sequence of interest. You wanna take that recombinant plasmid and use that in order to genetically engineer the bacterial cells. The process by which we get bacterial cells to take in foreign genetic material is known as transformation. This is a process that bacteria do naturally, but we have ways to make it happen at a higher rate in the lab. This generally involves exposing the bacteria to particular chemicals, usually calcium chloride, and rapidly oscillating the temperature that the bacteria is in in order to induce what's known as heat shock. Both of these processes are designed to make the bacteria what we call competent to take in the foreign plasmids. After the plasmid has been placed into the bacteria, we then need to screen out those bacteria that have been successfully genetically engineered from those that haven't. This is where our reporter genes come in handy. If our plasmid has a gene for antibiotic resistance, we can simply put our bacteria into a culture that has that antibiotic, with the result being that the antibiotic will kill off every bacterial cell that did not take in the plasmid and therefore doesn't have resistance. We can do similar things by looking at the color of the bacterial cells that are produced and use that to inform us as to whether or not the bacteria have taken in the plasmid or haven't. 
What you see here in this image are colonies of cells that have all arisen from successfully transformed bacterial cells that have been transformed to produce green fluorescent protein. You can see them glowing green under this UV light, which is how we know that they're expressing that protein. Of course, we're not limited to things like green fluorescent protein. There are lots of other proteins that we might want to produce in large amounts. Things like insulin or clotting factors are used in the treatment of human diseases, and those proteins are, almost without exception, produced by recombinant bacteria in the modern era. We're also not limited to engineering bacteria. We can actually genetically engineer all lineages of life, including eukaryotic cells. This image shows the neurons in the brains of mice that have been engineered to produce different fluorescent colors to help scientists when investigating the connections that these neurons are making. This image shows golden rice compared to its natural varietal. You can see how it got that name. Golden rice is a strain of rice that's been engineered to produce more vitamin A in the grain to help counter some of the pro some of the physiological problems that result from vitamin A deficiency in the developing world, things like blindness. Cutting edge approaches to genetic engineering look to do things like gene therapy. Gene therapy attempts to remove defective genes and deliver working copies of those genes to organisms that are alive and functioning in the world. Many of these approaches use vectors like modified viruses as their DNA delivery vehicles of choice. More recently has been the development of the CRISPR technology, which allows for pinpoint DNA editing. Using CRISPR, genetic engineers should be able to engineer any location in the genome without accidentally affecting or engineering other locations in the genome, which up until now has been a pretty big issue that needed to be solved in genetic engineering approaches. The CRISPR system was actually discovered in bacterial cells who use it as another part of their bacterial immune system to protect against viruses. In biotechnology approaches, this native system has been adapted to be used in all different types of cells in order to deliver customized DNA molecules that are created in the lab. It's an incredibly powerful technology that's only just now coming online. Another cutting edge approach for genetic engineering is the field of synthetic biology, where scientists are attempting to produce genomes and in some cases complete organisms that are totally engineered from the ground up. Complete synthetic genomes have already been developed. A rough map of the first one is shown here in this slide. But synthetic biologists are really looking to develop a standardized library of genetic parts that they can then put together in order to build structures in much the same way that other engineers look to build structures in the macro world through a standardized collection of tools and equipment. Genetic testing is another major area where biotechnology has widespread application. This is actually my results for my ability to be able to smell asparagus odor in my urine. This test result comes from a process known as genotyping, wherein specific locations in my genome that are associated with different traits are analyzed, and the results of that analysis are then presented to people like me to be able to interpret. Obviously, the ability to smell asparagus odor in my urine is not some sort of life or death issue, but the same process that is used here could be used to determine the likelihood of, of developing particular genetic diseases, like certain forms of cancer, or even perhaps things like Alzheimer's. In an example like the asparagus test, you look at differences at, sp at single spots or single loci in the genome. Different people will have different bases in these loci, which is why they get their name single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Large numbers of SNPs can be analyzed at the same time by using constructs like gene chips, which have a variety of different SNPs in different locations throughout the genome that a sample of DNA molecules is then exposed to, with the results of that exposure being visualized through fluorescence-based analyses. By looking at the pattern of expression on a chip like this, you can get information about the particular SNPs that are at different locations throughout an organism's genome, and how those might change in circumstances like the development of different kinds of cancers, for example. Another major way that genetic testing works is through taking advantage of what are called restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or RIFLIPS. In order to understand this, let's look at this hypothetical example. This image shows two different alleles for the same trait. Allele 1 has two different restriction sites, both bracketing the allele. Allele 2 has three different restriction sites, with one of the restriction sites in the middle of the allele. If we treat these genes with restriction enzymes, we're going to get different sized bands that are produced as a result. We can visualize those results on an agarose gel. Individuals who are homozygous for allele 1 will only produce one fragment. Individuals who are homozygous for allele 2 will only produce two fragments. Individuals who are heterozygous for allele 1 and allele 2 will wind up producing all three of the fragments that we see in the two homozygotes. Because the individuals have different sized restriction fragments produced as a result of the presence or absence of different sequences, we get the name restriction fragment length polymorphism, or RIFLIP. It's important to remember that these are just a couple of examples of how genetic testing works. There are many other examples and many other applications of genetic testing that are already being used in biotechnology. The next application we're going to talk about is cloning, and any asexually reproducing organism is producing a genetic clone of itself. When we talk about cloning here, what we're talking about are organisms who 
generally reproduce sexually and usually reproduce sexually that we are making reproduce asexually in the lab. A famous example of this is Dolly, who was the first mammal ever cloned, brought to term, and then lived her life. She was cloned in the mid-90s. The point of Dolly is not that we can clone sheep. It's that if we can clone sheep, we can clone pretty much any mammal on the planet if we want to. Let's look at how we clone Dolly. Dolly was cloned through a process known as somatic cell nuclear transfer. The underlying theory is relatively easy to get your head around. The nucleus of a somatic cell is removed from a donor animal. The nucleus of an egg cell is also removed and discarded. You then place the nucleus from the somatic cell into the egg cell. Somatic cell nuclei are diploid, and so they have all of the genetic material necessary to give rise to an organism. They don't need to be fertilized. But what does need to happen is that that egg cell now needs to be tricked into thinking it's been fertilized. This is usually accomplished by exposing the egg cell to an electropulse, which then begins the process of development. The developing embryo is then implanted into a surrogate, and the surrogate brings that embryo to term, and you get a cloned sheep or a cloned any other sexually reproducing animal that you want, including cloned primates. This is what we call reproductive cloning. Similar to reproductive cloning is therapeutic cloning, which is the production of populations of stem cells that can give rise to different tissue types that we find in the organism. Many diseases are caused by the death of particular populations of cells in our body. Since most cells in our body are stuck in a non-dividing state, in many instances, when these cells die, there's no naturally occurring mechanism by which those cells can be replaced. The aim of therapeutic cloning is to produce stem cells, which are cells that we can then use to give rise to the different types of cells in our body to replace those populations of cells. This could be used for approaches like regenerating nerve tissue for people who suffer spinal injuries, or even for the production of whole new organs to replace ones that may be diseased or defective in our body. It's important to understand that therapeutic cloning still requires the generation of embryonic stem cells, at least for now. Many scientists are working to see if they can take existing stem cell populations in adult humans and get them to revert back to a state that more approximates embryonic stem cells so that they can then be used to give rise to a wider variety of replacement cells and tissues. Before we wrap this video, we should talk a little bit about what can we do. We are currently at a time and place in our understanding of the human genome where if we have enough money and enough time and devote enough effort to research, we can do essentially anything that we want to that's within the possible range of our technology. If you want to clone a pet cat or a pet dog, you can do that right now if you have enough money to pay for the process. But just because we can do something does not mean that we should do it. When considering questions of what should we do, I'm afraid that I can't answer that question for you. That's a question that we need to answer together as a society. And it's a question that people have been answering for a very long time. There are laws that prevent us from doing certain things, like cloning humans for reproductive purposes. And there are laws that prevent people from doing things like engineering customized dangerous viruses to release into the world. The considerations and discussions that go into making these determinations are ongoing conversations that are going to need to continue as our understanding and capabilities in the realm of biotechnology continue to develop. We might do well to take examples from recent history, such as the Asylum Art Conference in 1975, during which the leading biotechnologists of the time convened in Asylum Art, California, in order to determine what would and would not be allowed going forward in the directions of genetic engineering research. The Asylum Art Conference is a great example of a process that was actually useful in establishing workable ethical guidelines for dealing with this technology. Going forward, we're going to have to have a lot more Asylum Art like events if we want to be able to navigate this world as successfully as we possibly can. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how biotechnology is used to genetically engineer, genetically test, and clone organisms. Make sure you can describe some of the real world applications of the processes that were discussed in this video. And finally, make sure that you can examine the ethical considerations that are related to applications of biotechnology. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.